It was in the very early morning of D-Day, when a C-47 aircraft with the serial number 42-100733 was carrying 4 crew members and 19 passengers. The passengers were paratroopers of Company I of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment of the 101st Airborne Division. Jumpmaster First Lieutenant Floyd R. Johnson wrote an official statement in August 1944 about his jump on D-Day. Quote, we encountered very heavy anti-aircraft fire and the plane seemed to be hit. We were over the entire peninsula before we got the green light. Looking out, I could see nothing but water. So I told the pilot to go back and jump us on France. He turned the plane around and we hit the coast of France near saint pierre de mont I jumped into the deep amid fire from 20mm shells and machine guns and after landing I couldn't see the plane. However, I am positive that the plane had been hit several times. End quote. The paratroopers were part of the airborne element of Operation Overlord, which started on June 6, 1944. On this day, known as D-Day, Americans, British, Canadian and French forces conducted seaborne and airborne landings on the Normandy coast, which marked the start of the liberation of Europe. Five beaches were selected for the seaborne landings. The British, French and Canadians were assigned to Gold, Juno and Sword beaches. The Americans were assigned to beaches Omaha and Utah. During the planning of the invasion, Allied intelligence had discovered a German gun battery situated between Omaha and Utah Beach on a cliff named Point de Hoc. It was believed the battery housed six 155mm guns that could fire on both Omaha and Utah. Under command of Colonel James Rudder, a ranger force of three companies was assigned to perform a seaborne landing, climb up the 25 to 30 meter cliff, and capture the guns. If successful, they had to form a defensive perimeter around Point du Hoc and wait for the link-up with other troops. After First Lieutenant Floyd Johnson jumped out of aircraft 42-10733, the C-47 did indeed crash into the English Channel. Johnson was one of four survivors. Private Niels Christensen was another survivor. Both men apparently led a ride on Point du Hoc before the arrival of the Rangers, but were captured. It seems that Johnson later escaped before the arrival of the Rangers, but Christensen did not. He was marched to a POW camp in Limburg, Germany, where he stayed until its liberation in March of 1945. Therefore, he did not write an official statement of his jump on D-Day and the whereabouts of the plane. The two other members that survived were Raymond L. Crouch and Leonard S. Goodgall. In August 1944, Goodgall stated, quote, I was in plane number 42-100733 in the early morning of June 6, 1944. The pilot made a pass over the jump foot, but we never got the green light until we were over the ocean. Lieutenant Johnson told the pilot to go back and try again. We hit the coast of France near saint pierre de mont flying east, southeast. I was number two man in the stick and I jumped and landed near the ocean. The last I saw of the plane, it was heading out to sea and it looked as if walls of fire were coming out of the plane. On both passes over France, we were under very intense fire from enemy heavy machine guns and 20mm anti-aircraft guns." End quote. Now Crouch also wrote down a statement, but it's similar to that of Goodgall's. Author Ian Gardner wrote a trilogy about the 3rd Battalion of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, and he spoke several times with Goodgall. Gardner inserted a big transcription of the conversation in his book, Tonight We Die As Men. The transcript shows that Google's memory was as crystal clear as when he wrote his statement in 1944. Quote, Suddenly all hell broke loose, the plane was tossed around and I thought we'd been hit in the tail. Private First Class News Christensen then told me that the right engine was on fire. Initially the plane went to a dive and then started to climb just as the green light came on. As we exited, I was hanging on to Christensen. My chute opened and I watched the burning plane crash into the sea. Looking down I realized that I was heading for open water. I jettisoned my leg bag and as much other equipment as I could and landed in shallow water just off the beach. I was completely lost. Then someone called out. It was Private Ray Crouch. 
we got together and tried to work out where we were. End quote. They decided to move west. Quote, As dawn broke, a boat came into view. It was carrying U.S. Rangers. I waved some white clothing at them, hoping they'd pick us up. But the boat sailed on past. We walked on along the beach to a headland that was being attacked by the rangers and came under fire. We started to take care of the wounded and Crouch attempted to retrieve first aid kits from the boats but was beaten back by rifle fire. As I recall, the USS Satterley, a destroyer, shelled the gun position. Then we went up the cliff. Once on top, we continued to be attacked from all sides and it took two days to secure the point. The rangers commanding officer, Colonel Rudder, ordered me to stake out a flag on the ground so that we wouldn't become targets for friendly fire. A little while later I was sent back to retrieve it and put it on the pole as a recognition sign for ground troops approaching from our front." End quote. Now a photograph of some rangers at Point du Hoc was made in June 1944. On first sight you can see a group of rangers sitting around in a bomb crater. But if you look very closely you can see that among the group is a paratrooper sitting behind one of the rangers. You can see that he has the 101st Airborne Division patch on his sleeve and is wearing his jumpsuit. Ian Gardner also featured this photograph in his book. And in his conversation with Goodgall, Goodgall said it was him. Quote, we were drinking coffee and eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches sent in by the battleship USS Texas. End quote. If we look at the operation reports of the USS Texas, you can see the following written for June 7, 1944. Quote, received information from USS Harding that the Ranger force at Point du Hoc was in serious difficulty and in need of small arms, ammunition and food and that the number of wounded at the foot of the cliff were badly in need of medical attention." End quote. Moving on with the Rangers, they came across some of the paratroopers on June 9th. On June 11th, after five days of fighting, the paratroopers returned to their original outfit, Company I of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Colonel Rudder, the commander of the Ranger Force, had written a letter for their officers about their whereabouts and putting them up for the Distinguished Service Cross. However, the officers did not believe that right away and apparently tore up the letter. Quote, they thought we were making the whole story up and laughed sarcastically, saying, We need a volunteer for a very dangerous mission. Google snapped back, I'll go any place for you. And he walked away, dismayed by their attitude. End quote. All that Crouch and Google had left were some ranger patches which they kept as a souvenir. It remains obscure what exactly happened with Johnston. In most available sources it looked like only Goodgo and Crouch returned to their unit safely. Goodgo did not mention Johnston being with them. Although the written report for the rangers mentioned that three paratroopers joined them at Point du Hoc. During the course of battle one of them was hit by shrapnel from an artillery shell. On an internet forum I came across a post about someone who was in contact with Johnson's wife and mentioned him being wounded in Normandy by shrapnel. But Johnson was not the only one hit. Goodgall himself was hit and wounded near Carentan after returning to their outfit. Now, unfortunately the US National Archives are closed and therefore I cannot get their individual records and the morning reports of the company to see when the individuals were wounded. It is most likely that Johnson was hit at Point du Hoc and evacuated with the Rangers. Hughes Christensen's POW camp was liberated in March 1945. He returned to the United States and married his wife with whom he had two children. He died in 1997 after a long illness. Lieutenant Johnson continued to fight with the 506th. He did a paratrooper jump in Holland and fought in the Battle of the Bulge. He also earned a Purple Heart, a Bronze Star and a Silver Star. After the war, he continued to serve as a career officer and retired in 1962. He was married and had a daughter. Johnston passed away in 1988 at the age of 67. Raymond Crouch also continued to fight in Holland, Belgium and Germany. I don't think he was wounded in the war, for he did not receive a Purple Heart. After the war, he had a wife and a son. Raymond Crouch passed away on December 26, 2006 after a courageous four-year battle with cancer. It looks like Leonard Goodgo is still alive and kicking at the age of 96. I'm not sure about this, but I have not been able to find a death report or anything similar 